<laughs> Hi, so we're live. I'm just gonna All wait right. a couple of seconds. Cool. Hey, we're both here. I'm Carrie Wedler. I am the editor in chief for the antimedia.org and I make a lot of videos on YouTube that offend people and are controversial. I guess that's what I've learned in the years of making them. And I'm here with Derek Rose of the Conscious Resistance. He's an amazing journalist as well. I'll let him introduce himself in just a moment. But first, I just wanted to go over what we're going to be talking about. So as you can see from the title, we're going to be talking about sort of extreme factions of collectivism. And I think that collectivism really happens everywhere around the world. It seems to just be a human trait. But I think it's particularly interesting in America where nationalism and American identity is just so rooted in individualism, yet we see really extreme types of collectivism, especially now. So we have feminism, we have Antifa, we have the alt-right, and I would argue that even Democrats and Republicans at this point are extreme collectives, but we're going to be getting into all of that, talking about what they are, how they developed, uh, are they useful, are they legitimate, what are the problems, and before we get into that, I'll let Derek introduce himself. Cool. Uh, what's up? My name is Derek. Thanks, first of all, to uh, Carrie for having me and for um, what's the, the name of the guy who helped us organize this? I can't remember his name, yeah. but oh, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you to put this, for putting this together and thank you to everybody who's watching this. So I'm a journalist, as Carrie said. I'm based in Houston, Texas. I work with the Anti-Media Activist Post, uh, Mint Press News, and I also run my own website, The Conscious Resistance Network. I've written a couple of books and my work focuses on anarchism and more uh, philosophical issues, but also, you know, building locally, focusing on how we as communities can take care of ourselves and not rely on corporate or state power so much. And, uh, you know, my work is directly affected by these type of issues. Cool. So uh, let's get to it. Um, so when I think of collectivism as a former liberal, what I go to first are things like feminism. And I wanted to start with that because I'm a woman. Um, I actually, before I started making videos about politics and freedom and all of that, I actually wrote a book on the effects of like culture and society on women. It's not done. I'm going to have to rewrite the whole thing if I ever publish it at all. But that was where my interests were. And so on some sides, I see the power of feminism, especially 100 years ago, 200 years ago, like throughout most of history, there was cause for women to feel like they needed to fight for their rights. Things have somewhat changed, in my opinion. And what I've seen with feminism is there seems to be a heavy reliance not only on deriving identity from being female, but also then trying to parlay that into government power and control. So as a female, I really don't feel represented when I see women marching down the street in pussy hats. Like that, that doesn't feel good to me. It doesn't feel like it's accomplishing anything. It feels like I'm being reduced to sexual organs. And then on top of that, to hear the discussion and the demands be around like free birth control. And I see very little respect for individual rights there because obviously that means we all have to pay for it. And it's a little troubling. Uh, that's one example of it. And Derek, I know that you're very knowledgeable about the alt-right. So I'm gonna let you sort of discuss what that is. Sure, can I can I ask you something about what you were just talking about? Feminism? Yeah, please do. <laughs> okay. okay, so. Um, you know, I have my views on feminism as well, and, and I think what you said as far as historically it having value, that's obviously true. Like, you look at the history, really, not even until that recently, like, men have had, white men specifically, have had lots of power over women and other, you know, other races and other ethnicities, and um, that's a, a system that existed and, and I think continues in some ways to this day, and there definitely were powerful fights that women uh, were taking. And when you talk about not feeling represented by, like, the the pink fuzzy hats and just different, I guess, strains or variants of modern day feminism. Do you think that the current, like, 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 say for example, we're going to the women's march coming up. Do you think the average person there is going is open to a feminism that isn't, you know, right in step with what they believe? Like, for example, uh, I remember seeing last year some women who consider themselves feminists but also said they supported Trump. Did said they were definitely not welcomed at that type of march and you know so do you think feminism today is really truly accepting of all like equality of all opinions and all women or just like this very narrow view of what that should mean i mean from what i've seen it seems to be an extremely narrow view um i i'm from los angeles so i'm from like liberal city and 
I didn't go to the march last year. We're going this year, so it should be really interesting to get to talk to women face to face. But from what I saw in my news feed, which was all people in Los Angeles all out there like taking selfies and like wearing their hats, um, I don't think that my opinions would have been welcome there because we're all in solidarity and everything until I say, but what if I don't want to fund your birth control? It, that's not okay. I, at the end of the day, it's still is forcing me to submit to a collective, whether that's feminism or whether it's the state. And I see problems in both of those types of collectivism. I'm not much of a collectivist, although I, I understand that it's just natural. People want to belong. They want to feel part of a group. And especially when they agree on something as fundamental as like personal identity, like feminism, to be a woman, like to reclaim your power from oppressed history. I, I understand, but I'm not necessarily expecting to be welcomed very sincerely when I go to the march. Um, it'll be all well and good as long as I'm dissing Trump. But I think, I think, and I could be wrong. I would have, I'd be really happy to be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. But the expectation is sort of that as soon as I start questioning those beliefs, there might be some pushback. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's a fair expectation. Uh, so I see there's a couple of questions and maybe we should address this one specifically because I, I think it really is important. And someone's saying, can we explicitly define collectivism, which uh, is a really, you know, it's the main, one of the main topics of what we're covering today. And I think we've already mentioned it a couple of times. So I'll tell you what I consider collectivism. And I guess you can share what you, uh, how you define it. For me, when I'm talking about collectivism, first of all, I think there's, there's several different ways to, that that word is used besides, you know, the, uh, various definitions of it. For example, some activists and say um, radicals on the left that I you know, grew up with, those left-leaning activists, when they talk about collectives, you know, generally they might be meaning like a commune or a co-op or some type of collective of people that live together or work together. So that, you know, that term is sometimes used in that way. And then other times people use collective and they, you know, they're thinking of this sort of maybe like a, in a positive way, the collective of humanity and, and some, um, you know, some human, humanistic sense. And the way that I think we're talking about tonight and what I'm, I'm having aversion to this idea of collectivism, which is the philosophy, and you find it in mixed in different political philosophies, but it's the philosophy that the collective, the whole, you know, the larger group is more important than the individual and that the individual's rights and liberties should be set aside, um, you know, temporarily or indefinitely in favor of the will or the desire of the collective. But of course the collective decision is usually being made by small people, those decisions, you know, they're not actually representing the whole of the people. And so we're gonna get more into that, but that's kind of how I define collectivism is this idea. And also I would say that as far as looking at people, judging people, like assuming collectives, like because somebody is a certain religion or a race or, or whatever other arbitrary category that they are the same as everybody else in that category. I think that's also this sense of collectivizing people, you know, so those are the ways that I tend to use it, thinking of collectivism as a philosophy that subordinates the individual underneath the collective and then in the sense of judging whole, you know, one individual based, you know, or a whole group of people based on one individual. Yeah, I completely agree. I want to definitely stress what Derek just said at the end, which is the tendency to then collectivize others, like to classify people into groups based on not necessarily an arbitrary designation, but some sort of demographic or belief. And I don't, I personally don't think that collectivism is inherently bad. And when I talk about collectivism, it's a shared belief, a shared identity. And for me, it has a lot to do with psychology. I hope that that's something that we can get into tonight. Just the reason why people do feel this need to be part of a group and to feel that I think what's really important in collectivism is being part of that group gives someone a sense of identity and gives them a sense of empowerment. And I think we see this in all of the factions that we're talking about tonight. It gives them a sense of belonging, which is a human need. I totally get that. But uh, for example, maybe I'm a collectivist in the sense of the yoga community. I love <laughs> being a yoga practitioner. You know, I don't think that's inherently bad. Uh, if we were to all get together and start condemning people who don't do yoga and start trying to force our beliefs on other people and like make laws that say everybody has to do yoga, I, that's where there's a problem. And I think that's sure. a lot of what we'll be talking about. Um, I hope that answers your question. For me, it's really, it's just the tendency of people to flock to groups and then to use that as really a foundation of their personal identity. So maybe it's more authoritarian collectivism you know, or involuntary yeah. collectivism. <laughs> right. Exactly. 
So with that said, did you want to talk about the alt-right, Derek? Okay, yeah, the alt-right. So I definitely want to preface this by saying I don't consider myself to be an expert of the alt-right, but I have written about uh, them a little bit and done a few videos and, and definitely have kept up and followed this burgeoning movement. I've been following it for a couple of years. Um, there's other people who've done some good work, including Jeffrey Tucker, but I did quite a bit uh, about a year and a half, maybe two years ago. I actually created this this map, uh, what I call a mind map, trying to understand why I was starting to see various anarcho-capitalists and libertarians start to go in this direction before it even had a name. And I started to read some of the blogs of uh, the early people who are considered, I guess, the founders when it was still considered the neo-reactionary movement. Um, this man that goes by the name Mencius Moldbug um, and, his, and his blog that you can find, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but if you look his name up, Mencius Moldbug, he has a I think his real name is Curtis Yarvin or something like that. And he's one of these tech guys from uh, Southern California, what they're now calling the alt-tech movement. You know, there's uh, for some reason, I guess, a lot of these alt-right types are also in technology uh, fields. So I started reading his stuff and seeing that he was writing about at one point being influenced by Murray Rothbard and Hans Hermann Hoppe and some of the same people that influence activists that we both know. And um, I saw that he took some of those ideas and then just began to twist them and say, oh, well, this is where they were wrong, though. It should be about ident race identity and just really start to pervert a lot of these different ideas. And um, so I I've been studying it for a while since then to just understand it, really, and see what's driving it. And it is interesting to see really how it's grown. Uh, I mean, I think at least on the Internet it's grown. In some ways, it, sometimes it seems like maybe it's it's simmered out, but I do think that the, it's at least shown, the last year has shown that there are people out there who are willing to go to the streets and chant things about, um, you know, Jews and just wanting to use, like people who are literally willing to use force against other people of a different color or different ethnicity. And these type of people, they tend to uh, call for an authoritarian leader. Like many of them do support Trump, and if not Trump, they do like the idea of some kind of strong man in power. Like that's one thing, a uh, characteristic. Because I do think it's a somewhat of a big tent movement. They try to st say that you can't define it, and I think that's probably a characteristic of this. And if you look up, uh, just understanding the history of fascism, uh, and I do think that there are elements of fascism within the alt right. I'm not saying the entire alt right is fascist but there are elements that would love for it to go in that direction. And a part of fascism is to never really reveal your position, you know, to conceal your true position. And they consider themselves pragmatists because they're willing to work with whoever they can in order to move themselves closer to the goal. And that's why they try to use vague language and do dog whistling to each other and signaling to each other the, you know, what they're really about, which uh, tends to be very nationalistic. They're, you know, this pro-American or European um, they're also very much against uh, illegal immigration, but not just illegal immigration. They want like militarized border. It seems like that they're totally okay with the militarization that's happening under Trump. Um, so they're you know pro-European. They're anti-immigration. They tend to have authoritarianism within them. And then there's some people within there who I think have just they they truly they they say that well they're so sick of being told by the left wing and society that you know because they're white or European that they're the problem. And I do think that there are some issues with the fact that like a white person, and I don't even like that word. I, I, I don't like, I don't think it means anything, but a European person, person, you know, that lives in America from European descent. Uh, I think that uh, if, if they say that they are proud of themselves, that they'll probably get treated much differently than people of color, including, you know, natives that I'm friends with and care about that are okay to express our pride and our, you know, and our nation or our tribal, um, groups, but then if, say, a uh, European does it, then it's automatically assumed to be racist by some people. And I think that is problematic. And so as a reaction to that, some of these people are going in a dark direction. It doesn't justify it in any way. And really, it just means they probably weren't that principle to begin with. But I can understand on some level what would push people to, as a reaction, be like, well, you know, you think I'm the problem? Well, then, you know, screw you or whatever. So there's a lot of layers to it. And uh, it, it is a complex issue. But Overall, I think those are the main driving forces. They have a flavor of authoritarianism. They're against immigration, and they uh, definitely are, you know, they're very nationalistic. Great. 
and nationalism is definitely a form of collectivism. Like I'm American, you know, even I'm Californian. Sometimes I fall into that. I love California despite the government, but I love, I love being Californian. I'm just going to say it. you guys call me crazy or whatever <laughs> if you want, but I love it here. Um, but I'm glad that you sort of touched on it in this way, because something I really wanted to talk about tonight was something I think that these factions have in common. And what I see very clearly is fear whether it's feminists being afraid of men. And I, I want to be careful not to just collectivize everybody here because we're sort of having a conversation about the problems of collectivism. So I don't want to imply that all feminists are afraid of men or that all people in the alt-right are hateful and bigoted. Like that's so not the point here. But yeah. from my interactions and from a lot of what I've read and what I've seen as far as conversations, not only on the internet, but in the media, um, just with thinkers and people who espouse these views, there tends to be a very strong fear of the other, of losing rights. And I think that that's something that's really key here is that people are really afraid that someone else is going to oppress them. And I know that some people some people might scoff at the alt-right feeling that way because white men have been in power for however long, but I don't think it's necessarily fair to discount their emotions. They feel these things. They do feel threatened. And whether that's fear of Muslims, fear of terrorism, fear of any other thing, that's real. And I don't think that we can just discount it and say it's not fair because there are plenty of people who also discount feminism and they would say that women are fine now and they're free. I personally, I've, I've never really experienced sexism and I'm really grateful for that, but I wouldn't discount someone who feels that they have. But I think that this fundamental fear is something that's really important, but I'm curious about this as we were starting our discussion. I'm curious what your opinion is. Does the fear come first and does that drive the collective or does the collective come first and does that drive the fear? I really, I'm glad that you're bringing up fear because this is something that I, for a while, and this is a bad habit of mine that I'm trying to let go of. Uh, I, I was really spending a lot of time debating people on Facebook, especially people who I considered to be at the very least online friends, if not real world friends who started to go in this direction, this like authoritarian collectivist direction. And I was like, what the heck is going on? And so I'd spend time and energy trying to talk to them. And I would say things like, I think that you're afraid of something like, you know, you're, that's what's driving this. Like you're afraid that they're coming to take your job. They're afraid that, you know, uh, you're being displaced through immigration. You're afraid that, you know, you can't express your, your pride for your people or whatever. There's all, it, the root of it, I really think does come down to fear. So it's important to acknowledge that uh, as far as what comes first, you know, there are collectives that are, are going to exist no matter what we exist as the collective of humanity, you know, just by, being alive you know whether we want to or not and then we have other collectives that we could say that we are a part of and maybe that's just the quality of you know human thinking that we like to divide each other up in these various groups and define each other in these collectives so those exist and as far as the fear I, i'm not sure where that comes from maybe it could be really rooted on some deeper psychological level of you know sort of evolutionary like of tribes you know conflict between tribes and the fear of other the fear of the people, you know, that are different and, you know, being conquered by them or being killed by, uh, you know, uh, foreign illnesses and things like that. So I don't know, it has multiple layers that, that I think we could take with it. But really, I do believe this is all being driven by fear. And it's a fear that is being played up and happily by the media, by the politicians. I personally consider, you know, Donald Trump and his whole presidency to be some sort of psyop, if you will. I mean, I don't know. It's definitely some excellent experiment in dividing the people. And and I really, we've talked about this, like just looking and seeing the amount of people, even like looking on anti-media or some of the different independent alternative media websites, Facebook pages, and seeing how many different people have followed who will come to the defense of Donald Trump no matter what, that we figure are supposed to be awake, you know, are supposed to be aware of some kind. It's kind of disturbing to see people, uh, you know, supporting it. Uh oh, did we lose Derek? He may have to refresh his page. One second. I'm still here. Are you guys still here? Um, sorry, just a moment. Figuring out technicalities. Oh, says Derek's here. You can see me. I can't see Derek. <laughs> I can't hear him either. Um, okay. One second, you guys. Sorry. Got some tech issues on Derek's side. He was on a good one, too. Hold on.
Well, in the meantime, um, okay. yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, we got it back. Okay, right, cool. that, <laughs> what Go on. Um, I don't know where I was at, but. Um... We were talking about how fear okay. is such a driver in media, in all these yeah, aspects. Yeah, my, my point was uh, that it's being, we're being, people's fears are being played against each other. And that's what we're seeing. And I really think that on a philosophical level, there's, there's problems with this. We, we need to look into why people go to fall in this belief of authoritarianism and what drives people towards that. And I also think it's really dangerous. And, and this is, a, I know something you want to talk about as far as the psychology of the crowd, but just... I've I've been watching this show recently. I'm just going to mention this because I know you like TV. It's called the 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 Handmaid's Tale, and it's based on like this old school book. Have you seen that? Yeah, that's really awesome. That people oh, yeah. should people should see that. But just when you watch that, and it's this future gone horribly wrong, right? And just really thinking about that, and I was asking myself like, these things happen so quickly, and at what point do you make a move? You either leave or you know intervene. It's just I feel like those things happen so quickly, and human beings we naturally will find a way to survive one way or another. We're going to do whatever it takes to be to stay alive. And so people will accept really dark and disturbing circumstances and maybe hold on to some hope that somehow things will change, but very few people actually make, you know, take steps to make that those things change and to prevent those things. Pretty scary and um I, I really am just intrigued by how that could happen and because i don't think we're that far from a society that could break out into just this crazy mob rule one way or the other when you see these people fighting on the streets the extreme left and extreme right and i don't think that represents that everybody on the left and right of course but when you see that happening i just feel like well we're, these people are totally playing into the state's hand right now it, it just it's ridiculous yeah, and I'm glad that you brought up the term the crowd. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going to bring this up tonight, but since you've said the term, I want to talk about it. So I recently read this book. It's called The Crowd, and it's by Gustave Le Bon. He's like this French sociologist from the 19th century. And I sort of get the feeling that he was an aristocrat and he was not a fan of democracy. Neither am I, but I feel like we got totally different reasons why. But one of the things he talked about throughout the book was sort of that it's, he called it contagion, the way that an idea spreads through a crowd. and he even talks about the fact that crowds don't have to all be the same type of person. They don't have to have the same intelligence level. They can be all kinds of different people. You can have a banker and you can have a carpenter in the same group. But if they find this one idea that they agree on and they have this one view, then it can snowball into mass effects. So one of the things he talked about was the French Revolution. And I, again, I get the feeling he sort of was like opposed to the French Revolution, but he talked about Robespierre and the way that the crowd just like went on and on with this beheading and this severe brutality. And I don't know if that was right or not. I, I haven't studied the French Revolution enough to know, but it's something that does spread so quickly, especially, and I think back to the psychology of it, I think that when you feel like you have other people backing you up and you have people agreeing with you, you can be very emboldened. And I can speak to that myself. When I have a video that gets a lot of likes and people agree with me, I feel so right. You know, it feels like, I've done something correct and that I, I'm justified in having these views. In reality, that's probably not, they're not related. It, we're just going back to like the majority, the idea of a majority rule. And I think, and did, if you want to say something about that, Derek, like what I just said, please do. But otherwise I wanted to bring up something else. No, I just <laughs> definitely think it is important for people to look into this idea of the crowd and, and to really, as individuals, ask ourselves like, if we're, this is, I think, the importance of being in tune with your principles and for one having principles that guide you in your actions because otherwise it is very easy to be uh, guided or manipulated by outside external forces and and that could be the state it could be media playing upon your own fears and helping you play right into you know your own uh, your own slavery essentially and I, I don't really want to see the world go in that direction with the world that would be created um, under the rule of the extreme right or the extreme left I really am just trying to find the people that are still somewhat sane and out there. Yeah, um, but when you mention extreme left and extreme right and all, I am curious because yeah. as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, and as I, I said in my post about this discussion, I, I would argue that even just mainstream Democrats and Republicans have become extremists. And I mean, maybe this is maybe this has always been true when you have a, a society or you have institutions and a form of governance where it pits people against each other, where you're going into the voting booth and you are voting so somebody else doesn't have power over you. Lysander Spooner talked about this in uh, No Treason, Constitution of No Authority. And this was like over 100 years ago. But 
it's this notion of you have to beat somebody back so that they don't take your rights. And I mean, what else are you going to do? That's people's justification. And it makes sense when people on the in the right or people on the right feel that they have to vote to stop the left and people on the left feel that they have to vote to stop the right. And this isn't specific to the radical left or the radical right. This is something that appears to be inherent just to the electoral yeah. system and to mainstream politics. And it's getting hard to differ. It's getting hard to find level headed people who subscribe to these ideologies. And so I guess my question is, well, I have multiple questions, but one of the things I'm wondering is, is it possible to be part of a collective and not end up viewing others as an enemy? Yeah, I think so. I, d I do think that you can be, you can recognize that you, as I said earlier, are part of humanity, right? And you want to, to help all of humanity and strive to take actions and, um, and have develop habits and practices that are taking into consideration of every other person in the environment as much as possible and those sort of things and live with that collective in mind without trying to oppress others to enforce your will. And also I want to comment because I know that if somebody listening to this considers themselves to be a nationalist and we don't make this point, they're going to make sure that, that we hear about it later. But I am aware of the idea, you know, the philosophy of civic nationalism. And this is what some people sometimes say that they're civic nationalists, that, you know, a nation doesn't necessarily entail a state. I think it could be true, but it's also difficult in some ways. Uh, you know, there are some um, First Nations in Canada and some Native American tribes here that consider themselves nations. And they're not completely sovereign, of course, they're essentially just like they're still colonies of the U.S. to one degree or another because they can't really assert themselves and completely self-govern. Uh, but they consider themselves to be a nation, right? But not in the sense of a nation that's going out and oppressing other people. And I think that a person could say that they are part of the collective of a nation. Because a nation, essentially, it, it could be it's a shared identity, whether that's because of cultural um, you know, identity or state boundaries or, you know, there's different things that people consider to be that connects a nation exactly. So it's, it's not as cut and dry as we sometimes think of it is. Um, so I do understand that, but overall what I'm against the collectivist ideas that I'm talking about are again authoritarian. So when somebody considers themselves to be their nation, whether that's America or even the Cherokee nation or the Choctaw nation, and they believe their nation is so much, they're more of supremacists and they think that their, their nation or their people are better. So they want to suppress or oppress others and their ability to live freely. That's where the problem really comes in. But you could also recognize that I'm part of the collective of native people of this land. You know, I'm part of this collective of the Choctaw Nation or, um, you know, any other sort of ethnic collective or, you know, as you said, different, there's different kinds of collectives like your yogi, uh, yogi community, right? But, and that doesn't necessarily have to entail force and authoritarianism and, and these kind of things. So that's really where the problem is. If people were just out there saying, like, hey, I want to uh, just, you know, recognize my ancestry and I think that we're awesome and that we have some great qualities and I'm very proud of it and this and that. And I want to live with just those people if I choose to. They should have the freedom to do so, you know, even if I disagree or not. I don't think there's really necessarily inherently wrong with that. The problem is when these people out there are literally talking about uh, going after to oppress other people. And whether that means the left who are like, you can't express yourself, so we're going to punch you in the face. And when I say extreme left, I want to, I, you, you are right that the Democrats and the Republicans are just as extreme. They're using the state as a weapon against everybody else to sort of enforce their will one way or the other. So, yeah, the whole system is violent. And I guess when we're talking about extreme left and right, those are just the people, I guess, who have gotten to the point where they're willing to go out the streets and use violence now. You know, and that's a new level of American politics that we haven't really been used to. Uh, and I don't know, I hope it doesn't become normalized because I think that will just continue to, you know, just get worse and worse as each side, you know, just grows and that's not a situation we want to deal with. Yeah, I agree. And something I want to touch on because I'm so glad you brought it up, just talking about how it sort of crosses the line when you're advocating forcing people to submit to things. So it's one thing if you want to have your collective, that's awesome. I have no problem with that. But for me, when you start using government to force people into doing things that they either morally object to or just simply don't want to fund it, they don't really have to have a reason. It's their choice as an individual. I think that's where we encounter problems. And something I've thought about for a long time, I think specific to American nationalism, I'm sure that if we were to go to other parts of the world, we would find similar patterns. But I'm American. I'm 
it is what it is. I've studied American history. I think something so unique, or at least something that very much defines American nationalism is that it's sort of inextricably linked to government in the sense that there was this American revolution against a tyrannical power. And in return, once they were freed, they created another government. And when you look at the constitution, you look at the bill of rights in, according to American mythology, these documents sort of mean that we're free. We're, we're taught that because we have this bill of rights, because we have the first amendment, the second amendment, all these other amendments, that's what makes us so liberated. That's what gives us our sovereignty. And I think that when you have the idea of national identity tied to government, I think it's really not a surprise that we see people sort of hinging their freedom on the idea of control of that government. And the reason I think it's somewhat specific or at least unique to the United States is that in other countries, nationalism has been around for like centuries, if not thousands of years. Whereas in America, it's still a very young country and it was born completely out of this formation of a government. And so it's really not a surprise that when Lysander Spooner was writing about these things now, I mean, it, it's been consistent that it seems that part of being American means using the government. Even if you're skeptical of government, you're still using the mechanisms provided by that government that you don't trust to imp impose your will on others. Um, and so I, I think that that's, that's an issue for me, I know, and it's something that has sort of bothered me for a while. And I guess I'm just wondering, I mean, I, I don't think collectivism is inherently bad, but is, is there a way out? Is there a way to separate the nation from the state or to separate feminism from progressive policies using government? I do think that there are ways to, to ascribe to different sets of philosophies that may be um, troubled by collectivism. For example, you mentioned feminism and you know, the nation state. There are people who consider themselves feminists who I don't I think don't call for state action and who also view people as individuals. You know, I don't know if they refer to themselves as libertarian feminists or individualist feminists or just feminists. Maybe they don't even ascribe to that label because there are plenty of people who might have similar ideals as someone who describes themselves as a feminist but has an aversion to that word for some of the reasons you mentioned or just because they don't like labels. And and that's fine. You know, some people are really they're like, you're not a feminist, you know, you must hate women or something. Um, I think that there are there are points to be made. There are still battles to be fought in that area, and there are also valid criticisms of that. And there are valid criticisms of the nation state, and uh, I think of maybe putting too much focus on identity politics. I'm not really. I feel like that is definitely a tool that is being used to divide the people right now, and and to instead of uniting us under really common causes like the growing police state, the growing surveillance state. Uh, you know, the wars that continue on and on, taxation, all these really basic issues that are affecting people across the board. We've seen people become more and more divided by uh, just partisan politics and then now by identity and race and these kind of things. So it's going to be difficult to salvage the idea that, okay, a nation can be something that's a peaceful entity and doesn't have to entail a state or doesn't have to entail, um, you know, calling for oppressing other people to install your nation because that's what it really comes down to. I think that if the all the extreme elements of the alt right were able to get power, like some of these Richard Spencers and others that we saw in Charlottesville, if they were to get power, then they would do some very dangerous things. And I also think if some people on the left who are out there fighting them had their way, they might ha be, be throwing business owners out on the street and collectivizing their businesses. And, and they consider that to be a good for the people and they don't consider that to be unjust. So I don't know, it could be problematic either way. I would say that those of us who see these problems happening and who are concerned about them and who value the individual and who understand that a nation can be a positive thing and that a collective isn't inherently wrong, but that using authoritarianism or force or violence to uh, you know, push your collective above other people, that that's problematic. If you see these issues, I would say continue to try to do outreach. It's difficult to reach people. There are some people who seem very just engaged into this belief and they don't want to let go maybe they're afraid maybe i really do think it does come down to fear maybe they thought that okay donald trump could be the you know hail mary for whatever reason that they they thought and they truly believe that good things are happening through this government and so they want to believe in it and the other side they feel very justified in their resistance and their their want for revolution and they have legitimate criticisms and claims but they are also just being used as pawns to divide people or they're calling for more state action so Outreach is important. Otherwise, we're going to lose the discussion, the debate to the people who are just getting more and more extreme and who are getting violent. And people, as you said, who are in the mainstream politics who also want to use violence against us via politics. Yeah. 
Completely agree with all that. Um, I wanted to add something though. We, we have about like 10 and a half minutes left and something that just occurred to me, but also that I've been thinking about a lot is when we talk about the sense of fear and people wanting to rule others, something I think that really factors into it, it goes beyond the collective and it comes right down to the individual because if you look at the rates of alcoholism and drug abuse in this country, like people aren't okay. That's just, and maybe they're, they're, they don't necessarily even have to be abusing drugs, but the economy is tough. I know that Trump's economy is exploding and everything, but for a very long time, there's been a lot of economic hardship and there has been a lot of inequality. And I'm not calling for government intervention to fix that. I think the Federal Reserve is behind a lot of that, but I think there is a sense of hopelessness. There's a sense of disempowerment. I think a lot of people feel I don't want to emasculate it, not in a sense of a man feeling feminized, though I think that is a consequence, um, or not feminized, but just feeling like they can't be masculine. I think that's a consequence of extreme feminism. But I mean, emasculated in a, well, I guess that's not the right word, never mind, but <laughs> just feeling like they're, they've lost their power. And this applies to everybody. And I think that when you have that kind of a feeling, I want to just bring up Nazi Germany. And I know that that's such a typical thing to cite. I'm not doing it because I want to compare Donald Trump to Hitler. I'm bringing it up because after World War I, the German people felt like they had been completely humiliated, like they lost the war, then they were forced to pay these reparations, the country went broke, there's horrible inflation, and they were looking for someone to blame. And this is normal. I mean, who wants to accept the fact that maybe they did something wrong, or their German Reich did something wrong. So I think that there's something there as far as people feeling like they're just disempowered. They don't, they don't feel confident in who they are. They don't feel like they can take care of themselves or their families. And I'm not speaking for everybody. Of course, I would, I don't want to collectivize everybody, but that seems to be a common thread. And I think the fact that people are suffering, not just like financially, but emotionally, just from the wounds they endure and incur throughout he being human, not even just in a political sense. But I think that that probably has something to do with how easy it is to hold contempt for others and to blame them for things that really they aren't responsible for. No, absolutely. I think that uh, there is a need for deeper healing in this situation. And of definitely there's a lot of there's a lot of pain in different communities that are being affected by this. You know, we're talking about women, right? And the history of uh, oppression of women and that being a valid concern and feminism existing for a reason because of that, for women standing up for themselves and the oppression of of blacks and slavery and the oppression of the Japanese being put into internment camps and the death of natives and all these different people and all these different individuals and, and different groups of, uh, of white individuals, Europeans who came here who were oppressed by uh, the state in different ways as well and who had to participate in this, this immoral system. So there's a lot of, I think, deep-seated trauma in this country in general and with the individuals here and what we're seeing is those differences being played against one another and that's what i think it really comes down to and then those fears being played against each other so i don't know maybe sometimes sometimes when i go in this direction that people think it's a cop out or they think it's kind of cheesy or they're not really ready for it. but i do think that that in interpersonal work is really where it, it, it matters the most because it is difficult to get sucked into starting to want to blame somebody else and blame another person and We've seen tyrants do it throughout history and governments do it throughout history. They give, they provide an enemy for the people to come together and feel unified against this enemy and, and justified and, and various dangerous actions. And I don't know, it's a, it's a really interesting reality that we're in right now. And I'm just hoping that more people will take it somewhat seriously and, and see that there is a possibility that the country could continue to go in this direction that we've seen it going in already but now it's not even just like you're afraid of the state itself that's in control it's like well is the state going to get taken over by one of these more extreme groups or temporarily and i do think that ultimately like some of the alt-right calls for ideas like secession and breaking down the united states to some uh, degree as far as providing more localized power and if people want to have their own independent communities and things of that sort that could probably solve some of these problems by letting people voluntarily organize and, and live how they choose and maybe that that could help things and until we go in that direction we're gonna have to live amongst each other and, and i live in houston which is one of the most diverse cities in in the country and there's just all kinds of there's like over 50 different ethnicities here and all kinds of amazing food and cool people and interesting cultures and uh, it's just really a foreign idea to me to be afraid to be around other people and to absorb that. So I hope other people out there will open their minds and their hearts and try to look past those ideas and look at the root of where this this need for authoritarianism comes from. Yeah, totally. And I, I just want to stress again, I think that 
again, to summarize, I don't think that collectivism is inherently bad. I think it's human nature. I think that the real problem comes when you start trying to force other people to adhere to your form of collectivism or to fit into whatever your worldview is. And I also just want to add, I'm thinking about it. And I think, I don't know if collectivism is just an inherent human trait, if it's a response to being afraid, if it's a response to feeling the need to fit in. I, it's probably a combination, but I found that even me, like I don't subscribe to left wing or, or right wing mainstream ideology. I don't consider myself alt right. I don't consider myself necessarily a feminist, but I know that for years when I was speaking out and making videos, I was absolutely collectivizing all sorts of people, you know, like, well, the left sucks and the right sucks. And these people all believe this and those people all believe that. And that's not the case. And I found that when I started communicating more peacefully and calmly with people who disagreed with me on my platforms, I found that they actually had way more nuanced views than I was giving them credit for. And I still disagree with like 90% of what they say, but it was a, a really humbling experience just to find out that the ways that I had categorized them and made assumptions about them, like that I wasn't right. I was totally wrong. And I mean, I it's easy to feel justified when you think that you're right. Of course, I think I'm right. I, I wouldn't say things I think are wrong. I'm saying things that I agree with. And I think that when you do feel justified, as we were talking about when I was talking about that book, The Crowd, it is a lot easier to feel emboldened and to turn against others. And so I just want to add that like, I'm not immune to this. And it's been like an evolving experience for me to learn to be conscious when I am making these assumptions and to sort of take a step back and remind myself that you can't, you don't know other people. You really don't. You can't make assumptions about groups. And I, I, for me, that's been the biggest lesson in, in helping remove myself from that collectivist mentality. Yeah, I definitely, I think I might have uh, sometimes just had a, you know, we're all guilty of having knee jerk reactions sometimes and uh, maybe collectivizing individuals or just not seeing them as individuals. I noticed we have a couple of comments down here. I want to address these before we run out of time. Yeah. Um, someone Definitely. said, I think one element not discussed is control. People want control over their lives and because other people can have significant impacts on your life, they want control over those people. The heart of all this is still self-determination, but the truth of society is we all impact one another. Just how much control over our own lives can we have or should we have and how can you have it without controlling others? I don't think that my freedom is contingent upon controlling anybody at all. I don't have a need to control other people. And someone says, what if what if forcing people to not commit murder, what if it is forcing people to not commit murder and not to take other people's property? Is that still collectivism? And no, I don't think so. I mean, that's just defending yourself. If you're trying to, if a group of people is trying to stop someone from killing somebody or taking your property, that is you're being aggressed upon by somebody else. So you, you have the right to defend yourself. I don't understand how that would be collectivism or uh, if I'm understanding the question. But yeah, those are just a couple of comments. Um, and yeah, I, I definitely think that uh, just taking the time, don't judge other people so quickly, but also, uh, you know, be skeptical of, of these ideologies that call you to point the finger at another group of people and assume that it's only the left. I see more and more activists just posting and talking and making content that it's just the, you know, the alt-right that's doing this, or it's just the leftists on this side and, and just more of that, you know, and for me, when I came into these various movements or this activism and internet journalism and such, it was because I was trying to get away from the dead stream, the corporate media, the left and the right. I was trying to find something new and I didn't really understand it philosophically. I just came like I needed to find something new, something that was different and outside of the, this worldview and this little uh, control system. And that's what I found. And there were many activists there. And now it seems like people are falling into the same trap of like, oh, no, it's the left again. It's the right again. And just different versions of that. And it's very sad to see. So don't fall into that trap. Yeah, I totally agree. And that, I mean, that applies, like you said, it applies to activists too. I've seen so many people, um, I guess, I, I don't want to assume I know why they're doing it, but I've seen so many people who get wrapped up in the anger. And as someone who has been wrapped up in the anger, I think it makes it so easy to be hateful towards others when you're frustrated. And when you see so many problems and you don't want to use government to solve them, but you see so many people who want to use government against you and Usually we tend to come when we're in our position, like Derek and I, like, or me, Derek and me, Derek, I don't know. I'm an editor and I, I'm not going to waste time on that. Um, but when you are in a position where you're sort of removed from the mainstream political thought, it's a lot easier, like to be frustrated and to be angry and to want to cast people aside. And I think we often come from, I came from a liberal background. I'm not sure what background you came from. I know people who came from far right wing backgrounds. And so I think we tend to swing back that way. I personally, I'm, I can't 
handle either. Like I, I really have to practice patience. I have to meditate every morning, but um, whether you are outside of the matrix, whether you're in the matrix, um, collectivism isn't bad, but maybe just don't hate other people so much and don't try to force them to submit to your worldview. I think that's the conclusion we have come to. Sounds good to me. All right. Thank you guys for watching. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining. Great talk. Thank you guys for the comments and thank you for hanging out with us. Cool. See you on cool. the internet. Until next time. Have a great night. Bye guys.